previous sections, we talked about the Lewis structures of covalent and ionic compounds. In this section, we want to look at the stability of ionic and covalent bonds. And just like we looked at the Lewis structures uh, for covalent and ionic compounds separately, we're going to look at the stability of ionic and covalent bonds separately, starting with covalent bonds. And you'll see here in this table, we have a stability of covalent bonds by based on what is called the bond energy. The bond energy is the energy required to break the bond. So the more energy that it takes to break the bond, the more stable it is. And this is just a table of various bond energies. But I want to look at some specifically. In fact, I want to look at the carbon-carbon single bond, the carbon-carbon double bond, and the carbon-carbon triple bond. You notice a single bond has a lower bond energy than a double bond, which has a lower bond energy than a triple bond. Said another way, a carbon-carbon triple bond is more stable than a double bond or more stable than a single bond because it takes more energy to break this bond. When we look at this in terms of bond lengths, we see that there's an inverse trend here. So the bond energy increases from a single to a double to a triple, and the bond length decreases. A carbon-carbon single bond is 1.54 angstroms, double is 1.34 angstroms, and a triple is 1.20 angstroms. So these are two trends that we need to be familiar with. First of all, a triple bond is more stable, and second of all, it is shorter than a double or a single bond. So these are two trends in covalent bond lengths and bond energies. It turns out we can actually use these bond energies very simple, similarly to we, the way we use enthalpy of formation because we have actual values. So I'm going to do this on a piece of paper. So enthalpy, if you'll recall, is basically the heat energy of a reaction, if you're looking at the enthalpy of a reaction. And in this case, we're looking at the enthalpy of the reaction for hydrogen plus chlorine yields 2HCl. So we want to look at what bonds are we going to break and what bonds are we going to form. And because enthalpy is a state function, we can do it this way. So we're going to break a hydrogen-hydrogen bond, and we're going to break a chlorine-chlorine bond, and we're going to form two chlorine-hydrogen bonds. So that's basically what we're going to do. And the enthalpy of this reaction is going to be the summation of the bonds broken minus the bonds formed. So let's look at what's going on here. So in this case, the enthalpy of this reaction is going to be the bond broken. So in this case, we're going to break an HH bond. And we're going to break an CLCL bond. And we're going to form two HCl bonds. And if you prefer, we can put in the Lewis structures here where we have the dots. I don't think it's entirely necessary, but I'm going to go ahead and put them in. So we're going to break this bond, and we're going to break this bond, and we're going to form two of these bonds. Well, the energy required to break this bond is 436 kilojoules per mole. And there's one mole. In this case, the enthalpy to break this bond is 234 kilojoules per mole, and there's one mole. So we want to add those together. We then want to subtract this bond, which we are going to form. So it's going to be the opposite of breaking it. So we want to take two times, because there's two moles, the 432 kilojoules that is required to break this bond. Since we're not breaking this bond, we're forming it, we make it negative. This is very much like the enthalpy of formation that we discussed in a previous chapter. When you do all this math, you find that the enthalpy um, of this reaction to form these two HCl is minus 185 kilojoules for the reaction as written. So this is just another way to use enthalpies, in this case using bond energies, in order to find the enthalpy of a reaction. And again, this works because enthalpy is a state function, which means it's independent of the path that you take. So now that we've looked a little bit about covalent bonds, let's look at ionic bonds. And there's something interesting 
um, going on with ionic bonds. And that is the lattice energy. So what I would like to show is that ionization energies and um, electron affinities do not explain well what is going on with um, the lattice energy or the stability of ionic compounds. If you think about trying to melt or boil an ionic compound, it takes a tremendous amount of energy. And the reason it takes a tremendous amount of energy is you have to separate those ions. And those positive and negatively charged ions like to be next to each other. So that's a very stable situation. But if we look at the ionization energy and the electron affinity, it doesn't add up. So here we have sodium going to sodium plus in the gas phase and giving off an electron. Believe it or not, that requires um, 496 kilojoules per mole. If we then take that electron and we give it to chlorine, and sometimes this is written as half Cl2 gas, or just one Cl gas, and we add an electron to it, we form Cl minus. That only gives off 349 kilojoules per mole. So we have a net of a positive energy, or we have to put energy in for this to happen. Well, if we have to put energy in for this to happen, sodium chloride should be very or relatively unstable, but it's not. Well, why is that? And the key here is, if you remember we stressed this when we were talking about electron affinity and ionization energy, that these ions are in the gas phase. And sodium chloride is not ions in the gas phase. So when those ions in the gas phase condense where the negatively charged chlorine is next to the positively charged sodium, and, it's and the sodiums are surrounded by chlorides, and so on and so forth, this is very stable. And when these condense into the gas phase, that is called the lattice energy. So it's not ions in the gas phase that are separated from each other. It's ions that are very close to each other. And that's where this stability comes from. And the lattice energy explains the stability of these ionic compounds. It's also important to point out, both because it's asked in questions and because it's good general knowledge, is that lattice energy is directly proportional with the melting point and the boiling point of an ionic compound. So if you're asked something about its relative melting point or its relative boiling point, what you're really being asked about is its relative lattice energy. Now it turns out that lattice energy is actually a difficult um, thing to calculate. And that leads us to this Born-Haber cycle. And I'm not going to ask you to actually calculate this in this course, but I do want to show it to you um, because it's a um, way of, of implementing Hess's law. And if you remember, Hess's law is what allows us to add multiple reactions together and then find out something about the um, overall reaction. It's very difficult to put two ions in the gas phase and then condense them because they're extremely attracted to each other and they're very reactive. So instead of that, we can use Hess's law to determine the lattice energy. So if we look at here, we basically the overall reaction is we have Cs in the gas phase plus half of a fluorine in the gas phase yields CSF as a solid. That would be um, the lattice energy. But we have to notice that several things have to happen. So what has to happen I should have pointed here, Cs plus in the gas phase plus S minor, F minus in the gas phase yields CSF solid. That's the lattice energy. Well, in order to get to this, first of all, we have to get cesium in the gas phase. That takes some energy. Then we have to take an electron away from cesium. So it goes from cesium in the gas phase to cesium plus in the gas phase. That takes some energy. We have to go from one half of F2 in the gas phase to F in the gas phase. And then finally, we have to... Um, take an electron and put it on the fluorine. And that's the only thing here that's exothermic. So the energy goes back down. So all of these other steps, we had to put energy in. And then when we give that electron to fluorine, the energy goes back down. If you know, that's exactly what we were showing with these two reactions here. The difference, this overall energy difference, is the lattice energy. So if we know the enthalpy of formation, and we know the enthalpy of all of these individual steps, we can calculate the lattice energy. Now again, you're not actually going to be asked to do this, but it is important to note that where this comes from. It's also important to note that this is an application of Hess's law. 
So what are the factors that affect lattice energy? What is this stuff you need to know? So in several of these um, chapters, we've showed some you know, mathematical calculations and then looked at the results of the mathematical calculations and focused on those. And that's what we're doing here. We're focusing on the results of the mathematical calculations. So there's two factors that affect lattice energy. And one is a more prominent factor, or a more important factor, and that is charge difference. And the charge difference you can think of on a number line. So the greater the difference in the charge, the greater the lattice energy. The lattice energy is greater, the melting point and the boiling point are also greater. So if we look at MgO, that has, um, um, magnesium has a charge of plus two, and oxygen has a charge of minus two. On a number line, those are four units apart between plus two and minus two. It has a greater melting boiling point and lattice energy than NaF. Why? Because the ion is plus two and this ion is minus two. Here, the ions are plus one and minus one. Since the ions have a greater charge difference, again, charge difference on a number line, they have a greater lattice energy. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because this is positive two and this is negative two. Those are gonna be more strongly attracted to, to each other than something that's plus one and minus one. The less prominent factor, which is ion size. And for this course, we only consider the ion size if the charge difference is the same. In some, you know, um, ex less clear examples, this may not always be the case. Um, for example, if you had um, very, very small ions versus much larger ions with a bigger charge difference, maybe there's some exotic case where this isn't true. Um, but for this course, we only consider the size if the charge difference is the same. So the smaller the ion, the greater the lattice energy. And this, is, uh, this factor also makes logical sense. Although we only consider it if the charge difference is the same, the way that um, you can think about this is smaller ions have the protons closer to the negatively charged ion because they're smaller. So that makes the lattice energy stronger. So LIF, which is two small ions, plus one and minus one, has a greater melting point, boiling point, and lattice energy than CSI. Again, plus one minus one, plus one minus one. But in this case, these ions are small, they're high up on the periodic table. And these ions are large, they're much lower on the periodic table. So therefore, these ions have a greater lattice energy because the nucleus is closer to the negatively charged ion and therefore it's more strongly held. So let's look at an example. We're gonna rank a few things in order of lattice energy. And to do this, I actually want to switch to the um, to the notes here. So here are some examples uh, where we want to rank things in terms of their lattice energy. So it says rank the following in order of increasing lattice energy. And much like in previous cases where we've um, ranked things, I strongly recommend you write what that what increasing means. Does that mean smallest first or biggest first? Well, increasing means smallest first. And if you make that translation, you're less likely to get it backwards, at least me. Um, some people probably don't need to do this. So here we have KCl, MgO, and RbBr. Notice that based on the previous slide, the first thing that we want to do is we want to determine the charge. So K is here, so it's plus one in ionic compounds. And Cl is here, so it's minus one in ionic compounds. Mg is 2a, so it's plus 2. O is uh, 6a, so it's minus 2. Rb is plus 1, because it's in 1a. And Br is minus 2, because, or excuse me, minus 1, because it's in 7a. So these are the charges. So we want the smallest first. We want the one with the lowest lattice energy. But we instantly know that MgO has the highest lattice energy. Why does MgO have the highest lattice energy? Because it has the greatest charge difference. Remember, think of this as a number line. So on a number line, you'd have minus two, minus one, zero, one, and two. So you basically have here to here. So that being your charge difference. Um, 
which would be four. Um, so that's how you want to think about the charge difference. So this charge difference is greater. So it's going to have the highest lattice energy. Well, how are we going to um, figure out the difference between KCL and RBBR? Well, if we look, K and CL are relatively high on the periodic table, so they're relatively small ions. The higher up on the periodic table, the smaller the atoms and ions are. RB and I are relatively low on the periodic table as, uh, as compared to K and CL. So these ions are bigger. The bigger the ion, the weaker the lattice energy, because these nuclei, this positively charged ion, is a little bit further away from this negatively charged ion, simply because it's bigger, which decreases the strength of the lattice energy. This is the minor effect, but it is a factor, and we consider it when the charges are the same. So in this case, Rb, Br is the lowest, smallest lattice energy. It is less than KCl, and they're both less than MgO. So we've now ranked them in terms of lattice energy. Now in the next one, it's a similar problem, except for it asks about the melting point. So it says, rank the following in order of decreasing melting point. Well, melting point is directly proportional with lattice energy. So since it's directly proportional with lattice energy, we're doing the same thing. We want to in, we want to put them in decreasing order of lattice energy. You don't want to learn this as three separate things, one for melting point, one for boiling point, and one for lattice energy. You want to learn it as one thing and realize that melting point and boiling point are the same as lattice energy. They're directly proportional. They're not the same values, but they're directly proportional with each other. So we want decreasing melting point. Well, decreasing means biggest first. So I want to translate that, and I want to put the one that's biggest first. Just like before, I want to um, write the charges of everything and see if there's any similar charges. So here I have plus 1, minus 2. Here I have plus 2, minus 2. Here I have plus 1, minus 1. So these are the charges. Well, on a number line, the difference between these is 3, these are 4, and these is 2. So, I want to um, put the biggest one first. Well, in this case, it's only charges. I don't need to consider size. So, when I do the charges, I find that MGS is the greatest because MG is in 2A, so it's plus 2, and S is in 6A, so it's minus 2. Now, let's look at Na2S as being next because Na is in plus 1, S is in minus 2 followed by NaCl. In the case of NaCl, we have a plus one and a minus one, so we have NaCl last. So this is how we can use the application of the Born-Haber cycle and the lattice energy to actually rank things in terms of their melting point, boiling point, and so on and so forth. The last point I'd like to make before uh, finishing up this section is, generally speaking, the melting point and boiling point of ionic compounds is much higher than that of covalent compounds. But it's very important to point out, when you boil an ionic compound, you actually break the ionic bond. When you boil a covalent compound, you do not break the bond. You do not actually break the bond between hydrogen and oxygen in water when you boil water. It's still H2O when it's steam. So they are different things. And um, that will come up again, so I thought it was important to uh, point that out. In this course, it will come up in general chemistry too.